So now we come to the 15 minute meditation, which is a requirement of the first five Saturday devotion. And tonight uh, I welcome Canon Ivan Aquila, Aquilina, sorry, from the Archdiocese of Southwark to join us in the meditation on the finding of Jesus in the temple. How lovely it is to be with you tonight to meditate on this mystery, the fifth joyful mystery of the Rosary. As you know, I'm Father Ivan. At the moment, um, I am in Malta, and I am very happy to share with you these meditations from the island, which was hallowed by the presence of the Apostle Saint Paul. It is quite a collision of joys that we are meditating on the finding of the Lord in the temple in the third Sunday of Lent. And as you know, the gospel in the third Sunday of Lent is Jesus being in the temple once again. This time, not having a chat with the wise people of the temple, but this time pushing people out of the temple because they should not have been there. As we enter this meditation into Jesus lost and found in the temple, I think we need to look at it with some theological spectacles on. And the first thing we need to understand, to unlock, so that we can enter into this mystery in a deep and meaningful way, is to discuss a little bit the temple and what it means and what it stands for and how Jesus would have seen it and how the people of God would have interacted with this place. And it's always good to start from the beginning, yes? And how did the temple come about? Why did they build the temple in Jerusalem? Why somewhere, not somewhere better? Why did they go there? And the reason is because, as you know, even today, many people call the temple as the Dome of the Rock, because there is a golden dome, and underneath this dome, there is a rock. What is that rock? That is the place, according to Jewish and Islamic tradition, and as Christians, we never had arguments with it, it might have been, where Abraham was going to sacrifice his son Isaac. That is where it happened. And because Abraham is the father in faith, and because Abraham is, you know, as we've seen today, those wonderful images of the Holy Father this morning in all of the Chaldees in Iraq, um, praying with Muslims um, in the place where Abraham started his journey because he is the father in faith for these big monotheistic faiths. So Abraham, let's put this into context. Abraham is asked to leave Ur to leave his security, to leave his bank account behind, and to leave the city to go where? To go in the desert. And as you know, the desert is a place of death, not a place of life. And yet Abraham goes because he trusts in God and not on his gut instinct. Let's translate that into English. Abraham places God first. The center of life for Abraham is God. And he doesn't question what God wants because he knows that God is God. And he knows that he, Abraham, is not God. He's not the center of everything. He trusts God especially when it doesn't make sense. And leaving your home, going in the desert, 
doesn't make sense, yet he does, he goes. And then, as you know, further on, Moses, Abraham is in the desert and God comes to speak to him and he says, Abraham, look up. And Abraham does and he says, what do you see? And he says, oh, stars. Can you count the stars, Abraham? No, I can't, there's too many. And he says, look down, what do you see? The sand. Can you count the grains of that sand, Abraham? No, I can't. You will have more children than the stars up there and the grains down there. Remember, at this time, Abraham didn't even have one child, not even one. And yet Abraham believes in the promise. Doesn't make sense, but he believes it. Finally, he gets one child. He has one son, Isaac. And he's happy. But it still doesn't make sense because one is not the grains and the sand and the stars and whatnot. But, you know, to put the cherry on the cake, when Isaac is around 12 years old, God says to him, take your child on Moriah and offer him as a sacrifice for me. And you could see internally Abraham was having a conversation Okay, so I leave everything, I come out, you tell me I'm going to have as many children as the stars up there, some below, and now the only one I have, the one you gave me, you want me to kill him. Yet you're God, I'm not God. I will trust you. It doesn't make sense. And if that wasn't enough, do you remember, as they were going, Isaac says, Daddy, Daddy, where is the sacrifice? Can you imagine how that opened, torn apart the heart of Abraham? Yet Abraham knows that God, God knows best. He is totally focused on God. And he goes on that rock. He's going to offer the sacrifice. You know the story how it goes. And God replaces Abraham's son with a ram and that's why they built the temple on that place because that is where God provided the sacrifice so they built the temple there so that they can continue they pick up from Abraham and they continue to offer in that place where God provided the sacrifice they will continue to offer the sacrifice that is why, even today, the people of the Jewish faith do not offer sacrifice anymore because they don't have the temple. The only place where they can offer sacrifice is in the temple. That is how central this is. I'm sorry it's long-winded, but this will make sense. Believe me, trust me, walk with me step by step. So we come on this rock and God provides the sacrifice. He removes Abraham's son and gives the ram. Now go down 2,000 years and we come to the time of Jesus. How old is Jesus in this story? The same age of Isaac, 12. And he goes in the same place in the temple. And what is God doing? God is placing in the temple the new lamb of sacrifice. God is removing the sacrifice and replacing it with his own son. Just as many years before he removed Isaac's son to put the ram, now he moves the ram and the other sacrifices and places his own son. Not because God has, you know, an appetite for blood or for butchering animals or people, not at all. But Jesus, as a human being also, could show us that the perfect act of love is giving, especially when that giving doesn't make sense. The crucifixion with human eyes the giving of his blood totally for those who hated him so much does not make sense. But like Abraham, 
Jesus shows us the way. We need to trust God, especially when we do not understand. So we have the sacrifice, the sun. Can you see where we're getting at here? Um, this temple is now getting a dimension of the intimate relationship with God, which is based, don't forget, on a rock. And do you remember Jesus chooses a rock, the new rock of Moriah. And this rock is not a piece of stone anymore, but it's a human being. You are Peter. You are the rock. So you see what Jesus is doing now, now that he is the sacrifice, not the lamb anymore, he is the sacrifice. He is replacing the dead stones of the temple with living stones. And you and I are part of that temple built on the faith of the rock of Peter. And today, Peter is known by another name. He's still alive, but we call him Francis. Um, it's this household of faith, this rock of faith. We are the temple, the holy temple of God, when we are together as a church, with Christ as our sacrifice in the center of it all the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. And this temple, this is the third shift now, we need to make sure it is kept as God wants it to be kept. Because I'm a living stone, I'm a temple of the Holy Spirit, and with the presence of Jesus in the midst of this temple, I need to find ways how to remove things which are not proper to be in this temple of the Holy Spirit, which is me. And that's the gospel of today, but I'm not going to talk about it because you will go to church and listen there, where Jesus pushes out what is wicked out of the temple. And we need to do the same. We need to take time to see what I'm going to push out from this temple of the Holy Spirit, which shouldn't be there. And the key to understand that is the first reading of the Mass tomorrow, the Ten Commandments. So now we understand the theological vision of the temple. God provides faith, being God-centered, trusting in God. God gives his own son for the cleansing of sin. And he changes the temple from a stone temple in Jerusalem to a living temple everywhere in the world and that's why as the catholic church we do not need temples we can say mass anywhere because we are the living temple where two or three are gathered in my name i am in their midst you don't need to go to jerusalem and so having said that now we can see how this story makes sense jesus and mary somehow lose sight of Jesus. They miss Jesus. But the greatness of it all is that they realize that they have missed Jesus. How many times we live without Jesus, without missing him? We live with an idea of Jesus, but not the reality of who Jesus is. Because we're not ready, like Abraham, like the Lord himself, to put the whole trust in God. When Mary and Joseph realized that they have lost Jesus, they quickly set out to seek him. And that's the second question we need to reflect upon on this mystery. Are we seeking Jesus? And seeking Jesus is three days. You know, in the Bible, numbers have meanings. Three days is a long time, a time when you suffer, where you have a difficult journey, when you don't, you can't make sense of it. The secret of the seeking of Jesus is not to give up ever. However dry, 
However, sometimes, you know, how many people say to me, Father, when I pray, I'm like talking to a rock. I get nothing out of it. You're seeking Jesus, keep at it. It's three days, it's a long, arduous, difficult journey. What you must never do is give up. And finally, in conclusion, this journey to seek Jesus is a mini Easter story every time it happens. There is the loss of Jesus. There is the sorrow. There is the suffering. There is the looking for Jesus, the seeking him. But then there is the joy of finding him. Mary did never think in a million years that she was going to find him among the doctors in the temple. And the other Mary, Mary Maudlin, never in a million years would she have thought that she's going to find him in the garden, disguised as a gardener. We just need to seek and allow God to surprise us. The joy of finding God, the joy of being this living temple, is very simple yet very profound to do the will of the Father, just like Abraham when he first went on that rock, just like Jesus when he said to Mary and Joseph, Why are you surprised? I was doing my Father's will, just like Peter, just like you and me. The rock doing the will of God based on the rock of faith. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. <laughs>